QR code on your cell phone might give you the URL to go to. So you should try that first, and you may have to. Uh, Welcome everyone okay. to a community-led program, a collaboration between Felton Library Friends and Santa Cruz Public Libraries. We feature members of the public sharing their knowledge in the areas of art, environment, and history. Access to safe and reliable water is something many of us take for granted. Tonight, we'll hear from Jim Mosier on the special challenges of running a water system in San Lorenzo Valley. Jim is a retired public health attorney and longtime resident of San Lorenzo Valley and has been involved in water issues in the valley for two decades. He was a leader in Felton Flow, Friends of Locally Owned Water, that waged a successful three-year campaign to buy out the 1,200 household Felton water system from California American Water Company and joined the SLV Water District in 2005. Calam was owned at the time by RWE, a German company and the third lar largest water company in the world. Jim has been active in water issues in San Lorenzo Valley since that time. He helped form the Friends of San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo Valley Water in 2018, a local citizens group dedicated to ensuring clean and healthy water for all San Lorenzo Valley residents. He is currently a citizen member on the San Lorenzo Valley Water Board's Budget and Finance Committee. Jim? Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you all coming. And just so you know, a little housekeeping. This is live streaming on YouTube. It will be available on YouTube and Community TV uh, on demand. So um, I'm going to do the slideshow, the uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to go through it, and then we'll do questions afterwards so that, um, that uh, the presentation will be available to everybody uh, online. Um, I also want to say that uh, originally this was uh, going to be a presentation primarily by Gail Mayhood, who is on the San Lorenzo Valley Water Board. She's been quite ill. She was unable to uh, attend. She also wanted me to clarify that if she had been presenting, it would not have been in her capacity as a board member, but rather as a private citizen. Um, and I should also say that I uh, stole a lot from her slides, but I created my own PowerPoint. Um, so that uh, I would be more comfortable presenting it. She had a lot of tech, she's a, a retired geologist from Stanford University, and uh, there were a whole lot in her slides that if I were presenting, I would be, uh, I would be not sure what I was talking about. <laughs> so I, uh, I simplified it considerably. Okay, with that, let's get started. Uh, this is called the Special Challenges of Running a Water System in San Lorenzo Valley. Um, one reason why we wanted to do this around this time of year is, and I'll talk about this later, the Water District is now engaged in a rate study to determine uh, what the rates will be uh, over the next five years. Um, and it's a very complicated process. Um, we thought it would be good to give some background on the district and its unique characteristics uh, in order to inform ratepayers uh, give them some background so that they can make some informed assessments of the rate study and the proposals that it will contain. In fact, the first part of the rate study is going to be presented to the board tomorrow night, 6.30. So um, we'll get a preview of uh, what the first steps will be in that rate study, looking at uh, some of the uh, expenses that the district is looking at over the next five years. I'll talk about some of that uh, today. Okay. So first, I uh, just want to start by noting what incredible resource the Water District is for the residents of the valley. It's a, we have a, a gorgeous, a unique and a fragile ecosystem, and it's a special privilege to live here. And here's, here's the um, challenge for us as residents. We need to balance the human needs for water with responsible watershed stewardship. It's a fragile environment. Uh, taking water out for human uh, uses uh, is something that we need uh, for re as residents here, but we have to do it in a way that uh, balances uh, the needs of the watershed uh, um, over, long, over the long term. 
Well, how is our district unique? As you can see from this, the <clears throat> our district is by far the largest uh, in Santa Cruz. Uh, a question I often get is, why do we? Why are our rates so much higher than everybody? All the other uh, districts in the valley. We have all this water right here in the valley. What What is it that makes our district more expensive to run than the other districts in the county? And I'm going to argue that really we have some unique characteristics that make us one of the most difficult water districts in the state, even uh, to run. Uh, and you can there there. Uh, Four, I believe it's four items I have on here. First of all, it's just the geography and the human settlement patterns. I'll get into that. The history of the district has created some unique challenges for us in running the district. We have a special disaster susceptibility. We all know about that. Um, and we have watershed maintenance and fire mitigation as a special responsibility for us in this district. You know, most urban districts don't have to worry about maintaining a watershed. Um, for instance, Santa Cruz City gets most of its water right here from the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, from the river, but they don't have uh, land ownership in the valley itself. So we collaborate with them for watershed maintenance, but we have a special responsibility uh, because we're located in the watershed itself. Let's start off with the geography and human sediment patterns. First of all, as I noted before, we have a very large geographic district. It's a large district uh, in terms of just the acreage. And yet, it's combined with a low population density. So we have uh, scattered housing. That means we've got to have pipes going in a lot of different directions over a large territory. And the ratio of piping to houses is much greater than most districts uh, not only in the county, but in the state, because we're a rural district. And this, add to that, our terrain. Uh, so we've got to pump water uh, up a lot. There's a lot of pumping we have to do. The water goes up and down. It's expensive to do that. Um, so it creates a lot of challenges. And we have widely spaced and large number of water sources. I'll get into that later. Um, so we don't have a single source of water. We have multiple sources. That's both a strength and a challenge. This means, as I said before, it means long runs of pipes. We have lots of pipes, and they go a lot of different places. Uh, that means a lot more maintenance than usual. There's a lot of uphill pumping. <coughs> um, there's storage challenges as a result of uh, the geography. <coughs> and long distances and difficult terrain for maintenance staff. So the staff has got to get uh, go to all these places to be able to maintain all the infrastructure um, and it adds a lot to the expenses. Added staffing requirements, there's energy costs associated with the geography, uh, and there's higher construction costs, as you can imagine, given both the terrain uh, and the, uh, the uh, amount of piping and storage we need. More main. Fuel and vehicle wear and tear. You don't think about that, but actually the district does have, uh, has to maintain this fleet of of uh, trucks and uh, uh, vehicle, other vehicles, uh, and they've got to be replaced more often than probably most other districts. Okay, now let's move on to the history. The district was formed in 1941. I'm going to do this really briefly, but I want to just point out some high points. Uh, and I want to say that uh, uh, Lou Ferris, who's here, uh, really helped me on this part of the show. And I also, I forgot to introduce you, Bob. Bob uh, Fultz is here. He's a member of the board, and uh, I know both of these uh, gentlemen know at least as much as I do about the district, so I'm looking forward to their comments uh, at the end of the talk. <clears throat> we were formed in 1941, but uh, that was just part of Boulder Creek is where the district started. We had uh, a whole bunch of small water district mergers, and just to give you a flavor of what this is like, over the years, it didn't all happen at once. It's this and this. La Pico, Felton, Felton Heights, Manana Woods, Olympia, North Boulder Creek, Bear Creek, Moon Meadow. And not only that, we're looking at two more Bracken Bay and Forest Hills uh, are in the process of joining the district. Those are two little districts up in the Boulder, above Boulder Creek that were virtually burned out during the CZU fire. 
Uh, and then there's the, Bull, uh, there's the uh, Big Basin Water District, uh, which is not in the process at this point of being uh, merged, but it is a very good possibility that over the next five years, that uh, merger may also happen with the district. We have, uh, so one of the problems with this is that the original infrastructure for many of these little districts, including our original one, was designed primarily for mountain vacation homes. Um, so what that means is little tanks sort of set away, the Felton Heights tank, for example, is uh, too small and it's leaking. The pipes are not, uh, they're not adequate for fire flow. Um, they're not up to code, um, and what happens is as the district would take in a new little district, it would try to kind of just gerrymander it into the district um, without having a plan for the whole, uh, uh, overall plan for the whole district. So it created a lot of uh, complications, uh, and then add to that that there's been a whole lot of deferred maintenance over the last 20 years. The, the can kept getting kicked down the road. Uh, it, it was a lot of expense involved. Meant there's some fights over uh, rates, and many of the boards kind of backed off from it. Or in the past, to the credit of the board, starting in 2016, this has been a, a major item uh, that's been given a lot of attention over the last seven years. Okay, this. Uh, this just shows you how many different water diversions that we have. We have about, what is it, 60% surface? 50, is it 60, 40, something like that, right? 50, 50. 50% 50, 50 of the water we get is from surface, about 50% is from wells. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's, a, it's a source of strength for us to have all of these sources of water, but on the other hand, it creates a lot of uh, potential expenses. We have three distinct service areas, Felton, Felton joined, that was uh, the Felton flow campaign. Uh, we have a distinct service area, but there's a distinct service area in Scotts Valley and then the rest. Um, and that just means there's some complications in terms of some of the state regulatory, uh, you know, how, how, how these two can interact with the others as a separate service area. I'm not going to go into any details about so what are the added costs? Well, we have extensive infrastructure repairs and upgrades that we need to do. Um, and this, it, we've, we've, been a, we've got $13 million uh, worth of infrastructure work that's being done or has been done. This is the probation tank. The probation tank, uh, I have a note here, we replaced a 100,000 gallon redwood tank that was leaking. This is a 500,000 gallon. So this is the kind of infrastructure that, it, that we need in the district um, over the long term. We have a lot of leaky tanks that need to be replaced. They're old, they're made out of uh, redwood instead of out of metal. Um, so it, it's a challenge, it's a big challenge. Recent projects, 13 million. We took out $30 million in loans uh, uh, in 2018. I can't remember exactly the year, but recently we took out $20 million in loans, $30 million, uh, at very low interest rates. We got them at the right time. So we're using that as a way of paying off the infrastructure costs while um, not having to raise a whole bunch of money all at once. Okay, now this is a topic we're all very familiar with, susceptibility to environmental disasters, wildfires, CCU fire, obviously, atmospheric rivers and heavy rains, floods and landslides and debris flows, earthquakes. Now, I'm not going to talk about earthquakes, but it is another, uh, another environmental challenge for the district. Um, the earthquakes can cause a lot of the similar damage I'm going to talk about with wildfires and atmospheric rivers. The entire, our entire uh, district is in moderate to high fire hazard severity zone. So you look at, that's up in here. We have uh, none of the other districts face this kind of uh, potential risk. They have some risk, but we have the highest risk of fire in the county. We're particularly vulnerable to wildfire damage. 
The surface water infrastructure is more exposed to damage. And the terrain and poor access hampers fire, uh, firefighters. So when the fire comes, as we experienced in the CZU fire, it is really hard to protect the infrastructure of the water district. Now that's something that we're working on, the district is working on, but we were not prepared for the level of damage that came with the CZU fire. The now, the estimated cost for the CZU fire is now at $75 million. Now FEMA will reimburse 90% uh, of the, as I have underlined, the eligible expenses. And, you know, talking with Rick Rogers about this, it's just, he's the uh, district manager, it's just been a nightmare working with FEMA because uh, you don't know what they're going to approve. There's just an enormous amount of paperwork. It's, um, the, the basic line is we will pay 90% if you replace it, place it the way it was. Mm -hmm. If you don't replace it the way it was, more paperwork. Um, and in many cases, you don't want to replace it the way it was. So, um, and the other thing is they don't pay till you've done the work. So, uh, according to the 22-23 budget, so far, since the fire, through June 30th, so far, we have received $476,000 from FEMA. We've spent $4,728,000. Million. So, you can imagine what that does both to our cash flow and to the challenge of figuring out, well, what are they going to pay us? How much can we spend? To, to repair it without getting ourselves in such a huge hole uh, if they don't come in with the money uh, that we go bankrupt. So it's just, it's, um, it's just really, really challenging. And uh, in fact, uh, Jimmy Panetta, our congressman, was having a fundraiser that I went to and my question to him was, can't you do something about how FEMA uh, interacts with, these, with our agencies that are dealing with the, with the damage from the fire because it's just been, uh, it's creating all of these problems, not just for our district, but it's across the state that we've had these problems. So right now, as I understand it, the board, the district is estimating SLVWD's cost on top of what FEMA gives us is about 20 million. That does not include a lot of staff time. And this is, I'll bring this back, uh, back uh, into the talks uh, uh, other times. When, when we think about capital improvement or, or, um, or uh, recovery from disasters, and who's, uh, when, when FEMA reimburses, they do reimburse for the labor costs and actually doing the repairs, as I understand it. But when it comes, say, to Rick Rogers' time in dealing with FEMA, with the budgetary uh, staff, uh, with the environmental staff that is all working on various aspects of this, that's all in the operating budget. Mm -hmm. And those costs are not covered by these uh, reimbursements that we're getting from the Fed. So we were fifth, uh, we did have a fire surcharge. You may remember we passed that in 2021, 20, I think. Um, and that's going to raise about $5 million. At the time, we thought the total cost was going to be $20 million. Um, so we're 15 million short in terms of what the ratepayers are contributing to cover the added costs above what we're going to get from FEMA. And I just thought it'd be, you, you, for those of you who haven't heard this, this is just a, a fascinating and challenging project that we have from the fire. What this red line shows is uh, the pipe, five mile pipe that was burned in the fire. It's above ground. It was a, a PVC pipe, um, and so that all has to be replaced, this five-mile stretch. This is the uh, P-vine intake, that's five, it's um, one mile? I can't remember exactly the length, but anyway, that's the second one that burned. These are <coughs> three really important intakes for us, the Sweetwater intake, Clear Creek, and uh, Foreman, which has now been connected, as I understand it. Uh, and P vine. So uh, <clears throat> the, the immediate thought was let's not replace it the way it was mm -hmm. because next fire it's going to burn again. Let's bury it. That's the best practice. We should bury this five mile pipe 
as well as the pea vine pipe. <coughs> so do we bury it? Well, the estimate came in from the consultants at around $50 million to bury it, to replace it and bury it. It would be more resistant. Obviously, it would, uh, it would uh, not burn in the next fire. But it requires a 14-foot bench. You literally have to build a road in that whole area. And when they originally put that pipe in, they brought the pipes in by helicopter, and they had crews walking in, uh, and they did it without having to build a big road and get big equipment in. Um, so there's some environmental issues around whether we should do it that way. So there are potential adverse environmental impacts. Surface replacement, this is what the pipe looked like um, before it burned. So it's less costly, although I don't think there's an estimate yet for what, exactly what that would be. It's much more susceptible to damage. Uh, but there's probably less invasive to the watershed, so less environmental damage. Um, I just threw this in. I'm not going to go through it. It just shows you the complication of what Bob and his fellow board members are having to deal with. Looking at this, this is four different types of pipe, the advantages, the pros and the cons. It doesn't even have a cost in there. Um, but it is a really complicated decision that has to be made about this, uh, how to replace these two pipelines. And put on top of that, FEMA, we don't know what FEMA is going to pay. What, 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 what will they approve? We have to make the decision before we get the final word from FEMA. So it is really complicated. Now let's move on to rains. Last winter, we got 31 plus inches of rain in, this, in, in our watershed. And take a look again. Look at the rest of the county. This is, this is the heaviest rain. Is this light purple. Um, if Gail were here now, she would be telling you why we get so much rain. <laughs> it has to do with the ge geologic formations, the, where the fault lines are, Ben Lomond Mountain. Um, we're just we're positioned for having lots and lots of rain. You all know that. Um, when we get these torrential rains, the runoff becomes so full of debris and sediment that it can't be treated. So it creates this, it, right away it creates a problem for the district because you have to switch the wells. Um, and we don't have a lot of storage. So it, the operations becomes really complex during the heavy rains. So one of the consequences of heavy rains is land, landslides and debris flow. And this is just a picture showing uh, the, the access road to the Lyon treatment plant. Uh, it was, it was uh, wiped out in 2017, uh, landslide in 2017, and uh, this last winter it happened again, so it had to be repaired again. And then we have the Huckleberry Island, uh, which is uh, uh, crossing the, the river, there's a pipe there. Uh, the bank got eroded because of all the rain. The 12-inch water pipe broke. The crew came and made an emergency repair right on the spot, which was really good because it was a really uh, critical line for the district. But the permanent repair to avoid the unstable ground, we're, we're talking another million dollars. This is just some more uh, the, the creek diversion structures are, are imperiled uh, during these heavy rains. Uh, this is a picture of a crew, the, the crew digging out rocks from the intake at Foreman. And then this is um, in uh, Fall Creek. The crew has had to get out and remove the weirs so that uh, they wouldn't be damaged. Just again saying this is the kind of ongoing staff challenges that happen in our valley because of these the special ge geography and susceptibility to, to um, disasters that we have. So the estimate for the 2022-2023 atmospheres river events is 4.5 million. Again, we're hoping to get 90% from FEMA. Um, and it, all the challenges involved with the fire uh, recovery are now put on, this is put on top of that. Uh, what are we, th almost three years out from the fire, and we're still, we still only have $476,000 from FEMA, and we're going through this enormous headache with all the paperwork, et cetera. Okay, let's uh, talk about watershed maintenance. Um, 
First of all, unlike many districts, San Luis Valley Water District has four separate properties that they own, that we, we own, I should say, because we're the ratepayers. Uh, it, so it's a pub, these are public lands that the water district needs to maintain. So, in no particular order, but um, here are some of the things that the uh, watershed maintenance involves for the district. First of all, uh, we have fish habitats and threatened species, both uh, in the valley generally, but in specifically in the properties that the district owns. These uh, involve some complicated uh, regulatory issues, but also a responsibility to make sure that, uh, as I said in my first slide, we're protecting the watershed at the same time uh, that we're meeting our human needs for water. So that's, that's a big one, the fish habitats. Uh, then there's the maintaining the forest and fire mitigation. And Larry Ford here is the one who's taught me most about this, the, 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 how we go about doing the fire mitigation. And Larry and I and Lou worked on this early on when Lou was on the board. Um, to come up with a plan for how we are going to uh, do our best to protect against future fires, the damage that future fires may cause. So the, one of the aspects of that is hardening uh, the infrastructure. Uh, so when we have, uh, the, we have pumps and uh, other infrastructure uh, on the property of the district, we need to make sure that they will not burn if the fire comes through again. And then think about those above, uh, why we don't want, want as little piping above ground as possible, because that's very hard to protect. And then we have uh, this picture down here, the rare sandhill habitats with invasive plants and endangered species. It's another, uh, another major, major responsibility that the district has, that many water districts have not at all. Um, and so, it's a lot what the district is dealing with. Uh, and again, like I said before, we're a small district, but yet we have all of these major issues and responsibilities uh, in order to maintain the district, provide, our, uh, provide all of us safe and reliable and good water, at the same time protecting the environment. Okay, so the next challenge has to do with interagency collaboration, and I call it collaboration and challenges. Um, the water, we share the watershed and the aquifer with other districts and other government agencies, obviously. So in order to do that protection, the district can't do it itself. It needs to collaborate with a variety of other agencies. The most obvious uh, one is Santa Cruz City and Scotts Valley, because Scotts Valley draws most of its water from the aquifer, the Santa Margarita aquifer, that we share with them, and Santa Cruz City um, takes, has the water rights to the river. So we have water rights to the creeks that flow into the river, but the, dist, the Santa Cruz has the rights to the water in the, in the river itself. So it's important that we're able to work with our partners uh, in order to be successful. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Santa Rita Margarita um, Groundwater Agency in just a minute. And then there's the collaboration and assistance from local, state, and federal agencies. Um, you know, the, the feds have been really, really important. Even though we haven't got the, the FEMA money, just imagine the state we'd be in if we didn't have the federal assistance that I think we will eventually get. It's too bad it's so complicated to get it. But there's also been a, a state funding for us. Um, and, of course, in terms of the fire mitigation, lots of help from the from the state, and then uh, local, uh, the county uh, has major response, uh, can be very helpful, we hope. Uh, we try to collaborate with them as much as we can in helping to coordinate all the various pieces uh, uh, and, and agencies that are up here in the valley. But you look at the challenges, one of the things I've learned over the years is that the regulatory requirements that the district faces um, are getting more and more complicated every year. Um, and particularly at the state level, there's been essentially a push to get, get, the, get the water districts to merge, to get, it's all oriented toward bigger districts. 
So we have a lot of regulatory requirements for our little district that are the same as, say, Oakland or San Francisco. Um, you know, giant agencies with big staffs um, and requiring us to fill out all kinds of uh, 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 forms and uh, meet all kinds of requirements that really don't apply to a rural district like ours. Uh, and so there's been a lot of pushback on it, not very successful, and that's been raising our costs that we're having to deal with um, this kind of, uh, of um, state regulatory environment. And what's frustrating to me about this really is, on the one hand, we're, they're treating us as if we're a giant water district. On the other hand, we're the ones who are expected to pull in these little districts. And, how, and that's, that's expensive. So we pull in the little districts, uh, and there's a lot of expense and staff time and challenges around doing that. Um, and it's like the county really, really wanted, for instance, Slum Pico to join our district. And yet, we, and we did that, and we did it because we're good neighbors, and it is important for the valley for all of us to be in the same district. So I support all of the mergers. But to, my experience with, with the county is, you do it, you do it. Oh, well, that's not our, that's not our, our jurisdiction. You get it done, but we'll sit back and watch while you do it. Is how it that's how it fe has felt to me, um, and it's been it's been frustrating. So the regulatory uh, issues are are problematic for the district. And then there's uh, this the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Now we do now have an approved groundwater sustainability plan. It's been negotiated over several years. Uh, we are one of I can't remember how many agencies, I think there's four uh, that are the, the major ones in it, but there's, you know, it's a big agency. Um, and what did I want to say? Oh, the, the um, cost, the, just the administrative cost for this agency is $500,000, and we get to pay 32% of it. What? So we're paying, our budget includes a hundred and about $130,000 every year to maintain this agency. Um, now the other districts, in, you know, uh, Santa Cruz City isn't in it, although they, they like to run it. They're not actually a member of the agency, they're affiliated. Uh, but Scotts Valley and the county, who are the other, what, I'm forgetting. Anyway, um, we, we pay 32%, I think it, there's a formula for determining what our share is. Um, and it's been very frustrating because um, the, the, the agency is essentially run by the staffs of the agencies involved. And our staff are so overwhelmed by all the work they have to do, they haven't been able to be as engaged in the process as Santa Cruz City and Santa Scotts Valley in particular, and the county. And so there's been a, we've had to really push back and some of the issues, San, Santa Cruz and Scotts Valley are had adding houses. They're expanding. They need more water. We don't need more water. We're, we're kind of static in terms of our, in fact, our water use has been going down because we're so good at conserving. But the other agents, so Santa Cruz in particular, wants to figure out how to get, have more water. And so they have solutions for protecting our aquifers that in, include infusing water back down the wells and and, and uh, very expensive process what we have going for us up here in the valley is that it's called conjunctive use and what conjunctive use is that we have great surface water uh, fall creek being a major contributor to this down here in felton we have we're all surface water down here up in boulder creek it's primarily well water if we can transfer our water in the summer, from here up to Boulder, I mean in the winter, up to Boulder Creek, the excess, excess um, surface water, then they can, we can rest the wells and protect the water, uh, the, uh, the uh, aquifer. And then in the, in the summer, when Fall Creek is getting so low uh, that we shouldn't be taking any more water out of it, we can bring water down from Boulder Creek. It's called conjunctive use. And this is a, a relatively inexpensive solution to uh, making a long-term plan for groundwater sustainability. 
Now, this plan has a bunch of options. It doesn't actually say we're going to do this, 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 and this. It's like a, it's like a laundry list. We're in a struggle with Santa Cruz in particular about how we're going to do this. Um, because our, our plan for protecting the watershed fits our needs up here, but it doesn't fit their needs. Um, so it's complicated. And then I want to just talk a little bit about this, because this really, this really makes me mad. This is Bear Creek Road. And Bear Creek Road had this slide. Uh, and you'll see there's a pipe here. That's the water district's pipe. So the, the history of this, according to Rick Rogers, the general manager, is that the water district knew for years that this road was susceptible to a slide. It was going to slide. And we had this pipe underneath it. And we kept talking to the county about, you've got to fix this. You've got to, you've got to protect against the slide. And the county didn't do anything. So the water district put a valve on the, up here and down here so that it, water could be turned off quickly if and when the slide actually happened. The slide happened. And the water district turned the water off really quick so that it minimized the damage. The county and the district staff met informally and they agreed, okay, that what we're going to do is the water district will fix the pipe and the county will fix the road. Lo and behold, right before the last day they could file a lawsuit, the county sued the water district, saying that the pipe had burst and caused the slide. Now, why would they do that? They did that because the water district has insurance and the county doesn't. That's why they did it. I mean, it's just flat out. Um, and so, it, but it didn't mean that the water district had no expenses, right? I mean, the fact you have insurance doesn't mean you don't have to go through all kinds of you know, there was, the lawyers spent a bunch of time, there was a lot of back and forth, filings of papers. I, I'm not even sure, um, you know, it all happens in closed session, so I don't know what settlement they came up with, but the, the insurance company took it over, and my bet is that they said, okay, county, let's not bother with a lawsuit. We'll, will you settle for this amount of money, and, and we'll walk away. That's what, but this is not the kind of collaboration we need. <laughs> Um, but it's a kind of thing, and then another thing that happened when we, in order for us to do the conjunctive use that I was talking about, we need to have the state water board approve it. We can't do this uh, moving water from Felton to Boulder Creek and back without a state water board approval. We are able to do it right now because we have an emergency approval because of the fire. So we've been able to test it out, and it's working. But in order to do it permanently, we need the water board, the state water board, to approve it. So we filed to, to, to do that. The city of Santa Cruz, it was just an unbelievable thing they did, I thought. They had 80-page legal document that they submitted to the water board protesting what we were doing. Um, uh, and so what that meant was that we now have to do an EIR, an environmental impact report which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to get the plan. Um, and they did not come to the district and say, we have these, they had some potentially legitimate concerns and mostly had to do with the flow of the water and its impact on the fish. That was the primary issue that they raised. Why didn't they come to the district and say, here are our concerns, let's figure out how to work it out instead of spending all that money on this big legal document, hiring an outside legal firm, uh, and then forcing us to go into this uh, expensive process in order to get the approval we need. It's in everybody's interest that we do this, the conjunctive use. Um, so it's just frustrating. Um, and it gets back to, so we've got a lot of work to do uh, in order to build uh, effective collaboration. Okay, summarizing the challenges. We need to recover from the the, the last fire and the last flood. We need to address the deferred maintenance and infrastructure issues that I described earlier. We need to prepare for future disasters. They're coming. We know that. Climate change is not going away. We need to protect the watershed and the ecosystem. Another big challenge given climate change, the droughts and everything else, I even talked about what the drought, how the drought has impacted the district. 
uh, prepare for future consolidations. Um, and, uh, and again, another complicated area for us to deal with. Build effective interagency collaboration. Maintain and support a highly competent staff. We are really fortunate up here. We have a very dedicated staff. When the fire happened, when the floods happened, the crews are out doing their work, making it possible that we never saw that water from our, from our, for our taps uh, being shut off or becoming contaminated, like they did up in Big Basin, where they're still dealing with up in Big Basin. Um, and we need to address budget shortfalls. So I want to talk a little bit about this rate study that I mentioned at the beginning. The board has hired Raftelis Consulting Firm, and it's preparing a port right now with recommendations and options. Uh, this is just a slide that came from the last rate increase that was approved in 2017, I believe. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that we're going to be seeing. You're going to see uh, uh, how much you did pay, you were paying, and how much you may have to pay if the rates go up, which I think they are. Um, so you can see uh, that uh, there will be a point in which all of us are going to be able to say, oh my God, this is going to be the impact of, uh, of, the, of the rate study on my pocketbook. We're not there yet. It's going to be a while before we have that. What's happening tomorrow and the week after is the first stage of setting this up by laying out what are the expenses and what do we need to raise over the next five years without getting into what, uh, what the rates might be. Revenue requirements for five years is what's being worked on now. Then there's the rate structure, and we have some options for how we want to structure the rates. Um, the way we used to do it in the district was we had what are called tiered rates. You paid a, a, a you first pay a set amount for getting the service at all, and then at, depending on how much water you use, you pay more per gallon the more you use and it's tiered. So if you're a heavy water user, you're going to pay the highest tier. There will be a highest tier for that excess water you're taking uh, at the top. Um, in 2016, I can't remember exactly what year, uh, a court case came down that said that tiered rates, water rates, violated 218 unless you could actually document that the people paying those highest rates are, have, are costing the district more so that they're justified in having to pay more per gallon. Uh, and I won't get into it's this complicated legal issue. We don't you need to know the details of it. Uh, but what happened then was all the, the most water districts had tiered rates in the state, and most of them dropped it immediately because they did not have uh, a basis for arguing that the people who are using this much water. Uh, this extra amount of water right here, this is the gap, that that's costing the district more to provide it to them than the people, than the, the uh, gallon, the, the uh, price per gallon uh, for the basic users. So we in 2017, I'm not sure of the dates, went to, a, went to this structure, which is everybody's paying the same amount per gallon, regardless of how much they use. So you pay more if you use more. But Felton saying, Library will be closing in 15 <laughs> minutes. Okay. We, we have the room till 6.30. Um, so um, we went to, went to, got rid of the tiered rates. What's happened since we did that, six, seven years ago, is that water districts have figured out how to justify tiered rates. Um, and it basically comes down to if you're using a whole lot of water, it means for, for instance, in our case, that means we have to have bigger tanks. That lion tank, the probation tank, needs to be 500,000 gallons. If we didn't have those heavy users, it could only be, it could have been only 200,000. So I'm just making up the numbers. But what Raftelis has done for numerous water districts is it has provided the legal justification for doing tiered rates. So that is on the table again as a possibility for us today. Setting what the basic rate is is also uh, was changed was changed considerably uh, seven years ago. That's another issue. How much should people pay for that basic rate? Uh, the the advantage for the district is if you have a, a, a higher basic rate, 
First of all, it reflects the actual cost of getting water to your house, if you take all the infrastructure costs. Um, but second of all, it provides a, a certain amount of money each year. Whereas if you have the tiered rates and you're relying primarily on water usage, that can vary considerably and then you have the budget, it creates more complications in the budget. So those are two important factors. There are other ways of uh, tiering the rates like uh, Oakland, uh, the Oakland district in Oakland charges people who live high up on the hill for the cost of pumping the water up there. So they have higher rates uh, based on their elevation. Um, I don't think we're going to consider that. I hope we don't in San Lorenzo Valley. I think it's too complicated, and I don't think that's fair. I think uh, the, the advantage of tiered rates is also promotes conservation. It is the best tool, according to the research, for promoting conservation is tiered rates. And that makes sense. Um, and that's why all the districts in California had it, or most districts had it, prior to 2017, 2016. And in fact, the governor, uh, advocated for it because we were trying to conserve water. So that court decision created some complications, but we've gotten over it. So another issue is low-income household assistance. Uh, we and the Friends of San Lorenzo Valley Water think, and I believe the district and, and as a whole believes that water is a human right. We don't want to deny people water to the district's credit. They no longer cut water off of people's houses, um, which we used to do. Um, and rather, there's a mechanism now for uh, charging overdue bills uh, to the property tax, to the uh, property tax, so that we don't have to send people out and tag their houses and uh, do all this. Um, we, we do have a low-income rate assistance program. Uh, it's a very modest one in the district right now, uh, but it is working. There was a state program that was helping uh, low-income households that is uh, phasing out. But we need to look at how we can help folks who don't have the resources to pay for the relatively expensive water that we have here in the district. Critical to this process is public engagement and input. Uh, what happened in 2016 uh, when the, we had the last rate increase come in is a lot, people really felt and were justified in my mind. They came to a meeting, they were told this is what's happening. Do you have any comments? Um, what do you think? Oh, by the way, it's essentially a done deal. Now is the time for us to get engaged in this process so we understand what the challenges are, which is why Gail and I thought it would be important to do this presentation now. What are the challenges? Why, why, what are the costs? Just why, where can we make uh, savings? Where do we have outside funding? Um, and what kind of how do we want to structure the rates, uh, et cetera. We need to be involved in this so that we're not surprised at the end and we end up with an uproar uh, because people aren't realizing, oh my God, I, I'm, my rates are going to go up that much. Uh, and you're just telling me that now. We don't want that. This time, we want to have a, we want to be involved in this. The board will listen. We want the board to hear our voices and reflect the concerns we have and the needs we have as a district. This is this is Gail's slide now. She had after after doing all the doom and gloom, <laughs> she had the reasons for optimism, and hers was a lot gloomier than mine. I just want to say. <laughs> uh, reasons for optimism. First of all, we have great water resources. It's delicious water, and we have all of these. We, that's, as I've been saying, we have this strength. We have good water resources. A lot of the state, they're facing really, really serious problems because the groundwater is, and, and they're, they, they don't have the kind of water resources we have. So that is, that is a really good thing. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a low growth rate, and that is an advantage because we're not having to plan for having to use more water. We, we have a status quo where it means that the conjunctive use plan could well be the solution for maintaining uh, the groundwater. Uh, conjunctive loose, we have that as an effective strategy, we think. And we have a lot of outside funding, funding sources. The district hired a grant uh, writer, and uh, in the budget, $4 million got raised for capital projects, aside from FEMA. 
the, the fish ladder is being rebuilt uh, on Fall Creek. A substantial chunk of that was from uh, Grant Ray. So, and we can, ex there's lots, there is lots of opportunities for funding from state and uh, private sources, and we're tapping into that, and that's going to be a big help. Our valuable and unique, uh, this is kind of, we, we place, it, it, coming and bringing full circle back to where we started. This is a public agency, we're so fortunate. You know, when we were doing felt and flow, we were dealing with, as Nancy said, RWE, the third largest water company in the world. Uh, and they didn't give a damn about Felton. They had one person working down here to interact with the community, and he was a PR guy. Um, and he was useless. Um, and they let, they just let the district, just the main, they didn't maintain it. They had no interest in collaborating with any of the other uh, agencies uh, around, you know, the county or the other water districts. Um, and if they had still owned the Felton Water District, during the fire and during these floods, it would have been really, really hard to, to get a coordinated plan going. We brought in the uh, Felton District, brought in the, the uh, treatment plant here in Felton, uh, and that, and, and Fall Creek, the water rights to Fall Creek, absolutely critical to the conjunctive use plan. So, um, making it a public agency means we run it. The, the, the five member board represent us, uh, we vote for them, we put them in office, we control this agency, we, the, the values of our communities can be reflected in the policies of the district. We have safe, delicious water, we have a beautiful watershed, and dedicated and talented staff, and I should have added one more bullet, especially because Bob's here. We have an amazing board. I mean, this is, I, I, I just gotta tell you, the, the five people on the board are, are heroes because it is a huge job, and guess what you get paid? <laughs> it's a huge job, and, and it's a dedication uh, to our community that they're willing to serve. So we're lucky to have uh, such a talented board uh, willing to do this work for us. And if any of you would like to run, uh, be, sure to, be sure to raise your hand, because <laughs> we need more talented people. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Bob. Would, would it be okay if I offered a few um, clarifications and augmentation on your information? Go ahead. <clears throat> um, we use, on the surface water, we use a little less than 1% of the average water that runs through the San Lorenzo River every year. So it's a, it's a pretty small amount. Uh, Santa Cruz usage is much bigger than, than ours. So we just need to keep that perspective uh, in mind when we talk about the water that we are using. From a conservation point of view, our district is about 20% under the state ultimate state mandate of 50 gallons per user per day indoor usage. We're already at about 35 to 40, depending on how you calculate it with population. We are so far ahead of the rest of the state in conservation that um, we, we need to celebrate that and, and not sort of pound on people about uh, con conserving more. Because at some point, you reach an asymptote on your usage, and you're just you're squeezing the stone, and you're not going to get a lot more out of it. And so at that point, you need to kind of shift a little bit. Um, could you go to the slide with the water sources? It's, it's. So just to clarify what our sources are, um, while we do have nominal presence in Silver Creek and Harmon Creek, we have no diversions at those locations. But we don't. Oh, okay. and, and have not had for quite a while. Uh, but if you look up in the state resources, you'll see those as assigned to San Lorenzo Valley Water District, but, but it's sort of like a, a zombie type situation. No, nothing is there. Also, um, 
the Manana Woods well that is no longer functional. Um, and I think there's only two wells in Pasa Tiempo. Um, we had to replace one because the, the well uh, casing failed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, it's showing three. Yeah, I, th I think it's only two. So right now what's online is Foreman, uh, Bennett, Bull, and Fall Creeks. Um, Foreman account, uh, historically Foreman accounted for about 40% of the surface water in Boulder Creek. Um, Clear Creek was about 30, uh, Peavine is about 20, and Sweetwater is about 10. So there, there's a relative advantage and disadvantage depending on which ones you want to pick up. Now, of course, Peavine and Clear and Sweetwater are all offline right now <clears throat> due to the fire. Um, so just some facts around where we get our water. Uh, historically, Boulder Creek has been about 50-50 well and surface, not all well. Um, with the fire, we've had to shift more to well, but with the emergency declaration, as Jim mentioned, we have been pulling more water from Fall Creek. We've also been sending water, surface water, to Scotts Valley in the wintertime as well. So that allows us to rest the wells in Scotts Valley. Basically, we're operating under the groundwater agreement, just not formally, as you pointed out. Why Santa Cruz would oppose such a thing is beyond me. I've written about this several times. Um, I really wish they would come to the table and actually talk to us about their concerns as opposed to uh, putting together, as you say, big legal documents. It's, 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 an, it's an incredible thing. We could implement the number one recommendation in the groundwater sustainability plan immediately if we had gotten uh, the, uh, if Santa Cruz hadn't opposed it. Right now, for whatever reason, the groundwater agency seems to be very focused on injection wells and ASR and other, what I consider boondoggles, that have zero benefit for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District community and are only gonna cost millions and millions of dollars to implement. There's no reason to do any of that when we have all this wonderful surface water in the winter available to us. Um, oh, you mentioned urban water de uh, designation. It only takes 3,000 connections to get an urban water designation. They have no waiting for what your density is. So if you have 3,000 connections over 150 square miles, you're an urban water district, the same as if you have 3,000 connections within about a three square mile area in Southern California. This is the insanity of bureaucrats running amok that have no perspective on what it takes to actually do things. We should not be designated an urban water system in any way, shape, or form, and subject to all of the regulation that goes along with being an urban water district. Um, it's, that is, that's absolutely. I'm glad you're reinforcing my message. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, just keep in mind on the fish situation, um, it's a little bit um, murkier. That, that is, there's no evidence that fish are up at the diversions on the creeks, but they are in the river. And so really the measurement that we did on, on fish, the, the, the measurement we did on fish was to determine whether or not the water we were pulling out was affecting the temperature and flow to the point where it would impact the fish further downstream from us. And the determination was that both high water and low water, no impact. So um, it's really clear to, to make sure that we don't impact the fish where we are. It's all further downstream. Um, but Bob, I, 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 that's a longer discussion about the fish. It, it is, but it, it is clear they're not up where we are. Yeah, but right. what our responsibility is to the fish. Oh, that's that's what we yeah. measured, and that's what we determined. We're meeting our responsibility um, with the diversions that we have. The responsibility according to the state. <coughs> according to our responsibility to the San Lorenzo Valley. 
And given that we're debate about it, I don't want get, to get in it. Get, I'm given just that we're using, out that you're just talking about the regulatory responsibility. And given and that we're using less than one percent of the overall watershed flow, given we yeah, don't and impact that temperature includes and all that, of, we are we have, not impacting. We, have the most, we are supporting we have the fish the most with what we system, do. Systems in the entire uh, west uh, west of the Mississippi, right that, here, that, and that puts a lot of effluent into the river. I, that's not, one of the concerns but that about is the not, fish and. But that is not a water district. I am the presenter concern. now, so I'm telling you I don't want to get into the fish stuff, but for you to say we're meeting our responsibility in the fish is not accurate. Well, it, 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 it is. It's not absolutely. accurate according to a lot of people. And, in and the we'll, we can talk debate. about it later. Okay, thank you for allowing me to offer some uh, perspective and some clarifications on thank that. You, thank you, Bob. There. Oh, thank you. I was really intrigued by the suggestion that. You know, we have so many uh, users and tanks and pipes and things, you know, throughout the San Lorenzo Valley. And I heard from Lou Ferris not long ago that, you know, maybe there is a way to rationalize this, you know, and have a long-term plan for consolidating some of the tanks and things. And beyond that, you know, it could, seems like it, it could be part of the fire response plan. You know, where, where do we need to have water tanks, you know, filled with water that could be used. Right. Like the CZU fire was, you know, completely missed the east side of the valley, luckily. Luckily. <laughs> but that was thanks to politics and things like that. But what, what if it had moved to the east side? Would, would we have been able to do that? Anyway, I think it's a really interesting long-term challenge. I and totally it, it agree. could cost it, a lot more money. It's Felton Heights, right, where the they have the little water district that's leaking, and, and there's a promise to build a new one. And it's, a, it's been this struggle because <laughs> that's a good place to put a big water tank yeah. for fire protection, at least for the houses up there. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it's an example of what you're talking about. Um, you know, the original tank was for this little tiny district built many years ago for vacation homes. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Uh, with Peabine down and the other two, what, what is the impact to the water supply? I mean, is there any way to just let them stay where they are without replacing You know, that I know cost? Bob might have a better answer for this. My understanding is uh, they're just very valuable resources. Um, we, it hasn't had a big impact on them because we've been able to move water from Fall Creek in terms of the ratio. We, we want to protect the aquifers. The less water we take out of the aquifer, the better, essentially. Um, so having those freshwater connections long term, we think are really, really important. Did, the, Bob, you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're what's called pre-1914 um, diversion sources. What that means is no regulation, or very, very light regulation. And that is a huge advantage because it allows us to operate, I mean, we're still operating responsibly, but it allows us to operate without a ton of uh, cost to do so at the, at the state regulatory level. Um, I mean, it, it is a fair question. I mean, Peavine and Foreman provide about 60% of what we were taking out before. You get into a discussion about cost versus benefit on rebuilding uh, the pipeline um, particularly if you were to do it on a surface plastic pipe that will just burn again uh, when the next fire comes, which, what, every 50 years or so, something like that, seems to be our track record here. From the past. From the past, it may, yeah. It may be faster. And, and could be faster. And so, you know, you do, and, and what does the community want to uh, pay for, right? Um, relative to going forward. So they, this is still an ongoing uh, discussion. It's an ongoing discussion. Uh, there, oh, one other, one other clarification. The um, cost to bury versus the above ground, the original um, requirement was about a $3 million difference. The bench required was not 14 feet the entire distance. Um, it, it would only be that for certain staging areas. The rest of it would be about five or six feet. Uh, which is about what the bench is right now on Peavine uh, that I've walked about half of. Uh, it, you, wouldn't, you would be able to continue to use that bench. But you wouldn't have second, to build a 14 There's a second foot. consulting firm now looking at there the is. cost. Right. There. So you're waiting to hear about that. There is. 
I've just told you the original one is between, I think it was 50 and 53, or 53 and 56, right. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? You have any online? I didn't. Okay. Um, Bob, I'd like to know your opinion about resiliency. If we don't um, reconnect those other sources, then what happens if there is another disaster and we lose some of our existing sources? Well, the, the Foreman Creek pipe has been buried. So, um, and that was an easy thing to do because it's a very short distance between the, tr the treatment uh, plant and the uh, diversion. Um, these are all considerations for how much of this you do um, and how much it's going to cost. So we, we have lost a lot of small sources over the years, I believe, as we consolidate. Um, and it just seems like we're getting more dependent on Fewer sources. Right? Well, the, the, the Harmon, uh, Silver, and Mignana Woods were not what they, you would call particularly productive. They might have been able to support a small number of people, but not anything at scale. Mm -hmm. So losing those really didn't impact the district very much at all. Losing Clear Creek, um, you know, because it's about 30%, that's a substantial number. Sweetwater, 10%. Mm, yeah, I mean, but yeah, this is a conversation we have to have. Anyway, Nancy. Um, yeah, the part about the city of Santa Cruz was really disturbing to me. Um, is there anything, uh, do you feel like that um, citizens of the whole valley could do? A petition, go to a water board, uh, or I don't think they have a water board, they have a water agency, right? It's the a city, city agency, right? The, yeah, uh, I mean, attend a meeting of theirs. I, I just, I just feel like it's pretty outrageous, and I wonder if, if it's, if there's still time to try to affect them to work and collaborate with, with. Well, the, 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 the trains left the station on the, oh, it has. On the okay. EIR requirement, as I yeah. understand it. Um, uh, Rosemary Menard was the head of that district. Yeah. And uh, our district had a hard time working with her. She's now retiring. We're going to have a new director. So there's going to be new people in the room. We'll have a new supervisor. Uh, I personally felt like the supervisor's office should have been really engaged in this. It wasn't. Um, so uh, we didn't get a lot of help uh, in terms of trying to figure out how to uh, work, work on this together. Uh, so, we, so there's some opportunities coming up. In general, I think showing up to the water district meeting down there isn't going to do a whole lot of good because they don't care about us. Yeah. I mean, they don't. They, they have huge issues that they're facing down there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I think it's more effective to try to get the county. If we're going to put pressure, that's where the pressure needs to be put, I think. Uh, but we also need to, you know, perhaps with a reset with the new staff, the conversation can change. It, I don't know. I, what Gail tells me is that it's gotten better with Scotts Valley. Uh, the, the director there has also retired. There's a new director there, someone that Rick works well with. And on the conjunctive use plan, uh, she tells me at least, she thinks there's a good opportunity that Scotts Valley will join us mm -hmm. in supporting that because it's to their benefit. Um, so I think there are opportunities to build this collaboration. Um, and uh, we'll see. Yes. Uh, um, we also have um, another water source that we could use, but we haven't yet. And it's just, we have a certain amount of access to the Newell Creek Reservoir. Yes, outflow. we do. I didn't, we bring, I didn't talk about that. Of their outflow, or 15% of their outflow. Uh, but we'd have to clean it there because it's recycled water coming out of right. that inflatable dam. And, that, you know, once they started doing that, they really mucked up the water. It used to be clean. Right. It now gets uh, algae blooms and things like that. So, um, it, um, and it's, it would be 
I don't know how expensive to right. build the, clean, the cleaning of that water. But it is a resource. Is it, is it still something that's a possible plan? Yes. It's, it's in the works. It's been, you know, it's, a, it, it's an interesting topic. I, you know, I haven't been directly involved in it, so uh, I'll just give you my understanding, which is, first of all, we got that right, uh, is it 10%? 12 percent. 12 percent of the water when the dam was built uh, because I can't remember, we had some it's land. Small creek. Yeah. It's so, 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 so we the negotiated our yeah. right to 12 percent of it. Um, during this battle with the, uh, around the uh, conjunctive use, mm -hmm. there was another issue going on in Santa Cruz City which was basically saying, oh you can't use that now because it'll lower, if, if you take that then it's going to affect, uh, adversely affect the fish. So you can't use it. Um, and so there was a negotiating about that. They backed off. Um, and so we have two choices. We could try to get a, try to get a pipe from, from uh, where the pipe comes down from the reservoir up to our treatment plant here in Felton. But it would need a serious upgrade at the plant in order to clean it, as you said. So it would be expensive. The other option is we have Santa Cruz clean it for us and we buy the water from them. Yeah. But, but also, um, it's now much more practical because there's now, at the reservoir, there's an inflow pipe and an outflow pipe. Before, it was one pipe, and sometimes it was running in, sometimes it was running out. No, and so now, with the outflow pipe, we have an easier extraction, and it will be right. consistent. But still, the problem is the cleaning of it. Bob, yes. Yeah, just a couple of quick facts on that. Um, we would have to pay for the water either way. So the raw water is not free. We have to pay for the raw water. Yeah, even 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 if we treat it, we have to pay Santa Cruz basically a wheeling fee. That is a oh, cost to transport the water to, right. you know, the collector. The water is free, but getting it is not free. Oh, right, yeah. but, yeah. but effectively we'd have to pay for the water. Um, there was a study done, I think, uh, 15 years ago on the upgrade cost of the plant. At that time, it was about six million. I'm estimating that would be somewhere around twenty-four million dollars today to do, given the regulations and other cost increases and all that, to be able to treat it ourselves. Um, it, but but there will be a study to come up with numbers in this. But I, I guarantee you, it's going to be eye popping. Any other questions? Anything online? Nope. Luke? Yeah, just one more comment on the Foreman Creek. You, you said that it's roughly 40% of the, the total flow? In, in, the, in, Boulder of those, of, in Boulder Creek. Of those in five Boulder connections. Creek. Of four. Four creeks. Yeah. So one of the things that I haven't heard about, but I've talked to some people about, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, and I don't understand why, is we have one creek which is already operating now and giving us 40% of the capacity. The plant in, and the lion plant in Boulder Creek is only is running at less than 50% of capacity. In the wintertime, we could dial that up and replace most of the water coming from the other creeks and delay having to reconnect those other creeks and the multi-million dollar project of trying to do the five-mile pipeline. Because, as you said, maybe all we need to do is to reconnect Clear Creek to Foreman and forget the other three. Because we're being pushed by the county and, San, and, and the city of Santa Cruz to put more water into the river. Well, those other creeks are now going into the river because they're not going into our settling ponds. Well, should we, I mean, it sounds to me like a no-brainer. We should be thinking that. In other words, you're not doing four-fifths of that pipeline. Well, the Clear Creek is right here, so it's still a really long run. But I'm saying, you've got, you, you've got time if you want it because you've got the capacity. And we have, by the way, we also have 50% capacity in, in, in uh, the, uh, the Felton plant. Mm -hmm. So we could bring water up from Felton. So why are we spending you know, tens of millions of dollars to replace a five mile pipeline that we don't really need? Yeah. Well, or apparently don't really need? That's, that's a good question. And uh, you know, the, it's a complicated answer, as, as, as our comments have suggested. It's, it's a valuable, really valuable resource. Um, to lose both of them, I think, would be problematic. And if you're going to build it all the way down here, you're talking about, I don't know, four miles? Maybe, and maybe you know, we need to see what the second consulting firm is going to come in on the cost. 
because I, I know that Rick Rogers was kind of uh, very skeptical of the idea that putting it above ground would only cost three million less than burying it, which is what that consulting firm, the first firm, said: fifty-three million versus fifty, putting it above above ground. So we'll see. We we need more information. The board needs more information. Um, it's a complicated decision, and I, I'm. I'm glad we have good board members to vet it and figure out what to do with, you know, with the staff. Yeah, yes. Two things. Uh, one, is it possible to truck that water? And two, um, oh God, I forgot what was two. <laughs> Build a new water treatment plant? Uh, no. Yeah, no, another just, intake. Yeah. Is, is well, trucking is truck? really expensive for gallon. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the question, I, you know, I forgot to repeat the questions. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to repeat the question. Yeah. The question was, what about trucking the water? Oh. Um, and I just think uh, the cost would just okay. be prohibitive. And I know what the other one was. Yeah. In 1989, what happened to your pipes? Did, was there any earthquake damage at that point? You know, Gail was going to talk about that. I don't know what the damage was. There was there considerable was. damage. I don't know if it was to the pipes. Yeah, it was substantial. Yeah. And in, at that time, and in, in a couple of disasters after that, FEMA has paid 75% of improvements to what was there before. Rick Rogers likes to use uh, one example of a two-inch pipe going across a creek that was suspended by a rope. Uh, <laughs> right? So FEMA did not make us put it back that way. <laughs> they actually paid 75% for an underground, uh, under creek crossing. Uh, so there is a possibility that they would do an upgrade as long as it was upgrade to code and not, you know, sort of platinum coated, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're just getting that right. to where it needs to be, I think there's a good chance that that will happen. Yeah, the challenge is that you don't know until you do it, <laughs> as I understand it. Well, you, they, you can, I mean, there's a balance there. You can wait and engage with them. And particularly in something like sixty million dollars or hundred million or whatever it's going to be, that would be a prudent thing to do. Yes. <laughs> I had a question. Yes. Um, you talked about the groundwater sustainability plan. Yeah. And uh, conjunctive use is part of that. Right. Are there any other costs such as stream monitoring or well monitoring or monitoring wells that the district might have to incur because of that? Let me get the slide up. So do I need, should I repeat the question? Yeah. I think we got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, are there any other costs around doing the conjunctive use plan, basically is what you're saying, in terms of monitoring, et cetera? <coughs> well, monitoring, monitoring wells, stream, stream water monitoring, those things. Yeah, that is all ongoing. That, that is happening. Uh, and that, that's part of why we're spending $140,000 a year just to maintain the agency. Uh, that well, well owners are also represented on this, uh, on, the, on the agency. Um, but to, it's, it's a very uh, sophisticated system being used to monitor, you know, more than one aquifer too. Uh, multiple aquifers and figuring out uh, um, what their levels are, how they're impacted by different types of uh, uh, rainfall, et cetera. So that is going to be an expense, whatever we do. Yes, I, I was part of the agency um, as a, a geologist and engineer. Uh -huh. and, and there are seven layers. And some are permeable to a layer above or below. So they're one over the other. But it's not in one big pool. Like the Santa Margarita, which is the top layer, comes way back out this way. And it's what Lompico used to use as their water source out of the well. But that was one of the layers that almost disappeared with Scotts Valley using more and more water out of the, um, out of the basin. And, and there's a lot that has to be washed in the basin. There's a, particularly at the Santa Margarita layer, there's a lot of um, poison spots. And that's one of the things that has to be watched. We set up a whole system for monitoring it. It's the 
uh, at Scotts Valley Drive and, um, and Mount Herman Road, one of those gas station concrete tanks leaked. That let out MTBE, and then it's why we have the, uh, what is it, um, Madonna uh, segment of the system. We started giving them water. Their, their wells were pulling up the MTBE. That's how it was found. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a very slippery chemical. You can't just take it back out. And then there was Watkins Johnson was just dumping chemistries out the back while they were making chips straight into the sand. There's dry cleaners, there's this, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different stuff. And each of it, each of those spaces has to be watched very carefully. And we have to, we have to stay within a boundary of uh, high and low level inside the Santa Margarita Atmosphere. And, yes, and, and so there's water coming in just by rainfall, and there's water being pulled out by different wells and things, right. and, and we may have to inject water into it to stay above this low level right. thing. And, and surface, surface, water, surface water also seeps down. There's 200 of these agencies in, in the state of California. Mm -hmm. There's three in this county. And, uh, and they all have their own varying problems. The one down in Soquel Capitola has the, the hardest one. They have saltwater intrusion. And you can't take saltwater back out if it gets into your freshwater. So they're putting in a layer of recycled water in between the clean water and the salt water to try and keep the intrusion from happening. That's a completely different problem than we've got. We don't yeah. have that problem. So there's different problems in different uh, basins. They all have, all of the agencies has to have an approved plan by the state of California. Ours is in, it's approved, but we had, we had to have certain extra test wells put in. I'm one of the people who required it to be done. We have to watch how these uh, pathogens move inside the basin as we are both injecting water in and taking water out. I just thought I'd fill you in a little yeah, bit yeah, on, thanks. on the process. Uh, yeah, just, just to just put people's mind at ease, um, the, the Boulder Creek, Ben Loman, Lompico area, when they do take water out of the wells, they're taking it out of the top aquifer, which is the Santa Margarita. It's a very productive aquifer for us up here. That's the Olympia Wells and the uh, Quail Hollow Wells are, are in that area. In Scotts Valley, we take out of the Lompico layer, which is sort of the next one down, um, and that's just for Scotts Valley. Scotts Valley takes out of both Lompico and the Butano layer, which is the deepest one. Um, and so they have a very different well structure than we do. Our, our aquifer recharges very quickly after um, a heavy winter rainfall like we had this year. It'll pop up 10, 15, 20 feet, like, you know, in a couple of seasons. And uh, I'm expecting we'll see that when we start getting our measurements in for this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the people shouldn't worry about the well water in, in, uh, in our area. It's, we, we have a very productive system. The, uh, this <coughs> example of the kind of struggle that went on in the agency, and perhaps you know about it, that Gail described it to me, was that how do you, how do you project rainfall over the next 20 years? <laughs> and that will affect what your projections are of what's going to happen to the aquifer, which then feeds back to what do, you, what do we need to do to keep it healthy? And the struggle was that Gail, who was our representative at the time, felt that the Santa Cruz City was pushing these projections that were wildly, uh, uh, wildly pessimistic about how much rain was going to come in. Therefore, we need to do way more to protect the aquifers uh, than, uh, than we would have said was needed. The, the conjunctive use would solve the problem, is what we're arguing. Saying, no, no, because the, rain, because the projections are, are, are that we're going to have so little rain, we've got to do the injection wells and the other, mm -hmm. uh, the other expensive uh, solutions. So one of the things that happened, and it just shows you how complicated it is and how important it is that we have solid uh, valley folks involved 
It's, it's yeah. really hard to project yeah. what weather will be. Yeah. Right. We, we saw that with, with that hur hurricane coming up right. from Mexico yeah. into Southern California. We don't have that happening all the time. <laughs> but we have had yeah. an awful lot more El Nino happening than we've ever had before. Yeah. They've been more, you know, the, the first records of San Lorenzo Valley's water uh, amounts showed the second year as 120 oh, yeah. inches and mm -hmm. stuff. And I thought, you know, there, there's something wrong with this picture because then there was the drought years of the 30s and the 20s and, and stuff like that. And we didn't have any kind of rainfall that was even half that. And then it started happening. The El Ninos came back. Yeah. And, you know, like this big X on Santa Cruz and they just come straight from Hawaii to Santa Cruz, yeah. and, well, it's, uh, it's, gonna, and it's, gonna, it can cause us more trouble as, as far as um, the tanks, the pipes, the roads, the... Oh yeah. Yeah, and we've got one coming this I'm gonna, way. I'm going to make that at 6.30, time to call it quits. I'll stay here if anybody wants to chat, uh, have other questions, and thank you all for coming. Thank well, you. Uh, I'll ask the tech, our tech crew.